Good morning, students. How are you today? Fine. You're fine? Everything is okay? Everything okay. Okay. That's good. Um, yesterday we ended talking about uh, linear programming and we will continue somewhat on that topic today. Um, we formulated a linear programming problem yesterday and it looked like this. And LP, we tend to use the abbreviation LP for linear programs. An LP example. Uh, and it looked as follows. We wanted to maximize a certain linear function which was 115 times x1 plus 90 times x2. And we had some constraints uh, taking care of the kind of mat material flow logic in this problem. There was a kind of uh, roll tops, uh, which, uh, uh, sorry, desks, which were produced, two types. This is the first type, this is the other type. And they kind of consumed uh, different amounts of wood. And we had a certain amount of wood available on our storage, and we could not kind of produce more than we had available. So uh, that is uh, what constructs these uh, constraints. We often write it like this, subject to, and then we write the constraints here, 10 times x1 plus 20 times x2 should be smaller than or equal to 200. This was one of these three types, pine I think, and then it was cedar, 4 times x1 plus 16 times x2 less than or equal to 128 and then finally 15 x1 plus uh, 10 times x2 uh, less than or equal to 220 and then finally both these x's should be positive. There is really no problem in allowing these x's to kind of vary freely but uh, the, the standard theory here kind of assumes that these variables are positive. So we, and in most cases that is of course the case. Uh, in this uh, situation where you want to produce something, negative production doesn't make any sense. It's reasonable to assume here that everything is produced positively. So this is the linear program. Normally we write it like this. Try to make it neat. Put the axis uh, in, in a column here and kind of put the uh, the constraint uh, signs here, so you, you kind of get uh, a reasonable structure to read. Um, <coughs> so, in most logistic projects, we kind of start like this. We formulate a model. Okay? It contains uh, numbers and letters. The letters typically variables, the numbers typically constants. And in some cases, there may be letters. Uh, uh, for the constants as well. Uh, the next step typically is to solve it, okay, to, to kind of be able to find a solution to the problem. In this case, the solution would be values for the two variables x1 and x2. We, we normally use a notation like this, x1 star equals something and x2 to star equals something else typically. And this star then kind of denotes that among all possible x's, this is the x which produces the optimal solution. In this case, the solution which maximizes this function subject to the set of constraints. So this is the basic standard notation we use in basically all optimization, uh, uh, also in logistics. So you should uh, kind of take note here. So every time, typically in this course, you see a star, it denotes an optimal value. And of course, given the optimal values, then we can produce the optimal objective function, which is kind of what we earn here, optimally. So there's a kind of corresponding set star here, which we get by kind of putting in the optimal values for our variables. So this is kind of basically what it uh, boils down to. So next, we will talk a little bit about solution. And for this type of problem, which is very easy, simple, contains only two variables and three constraints, uh, we can uh, devise a graphical solution. I think we should start there. OK, 
okay? To look at the graphical solution. I'll just take this one out. <coughs> And let us look at uh, a graphical solu solution here. Uh, we can, as we did in microeconomics, this is kind of a similar way of doing it, uh, we can look at uh, uh, a graph or figure in an x1, x2 plane. And we typically start by drawing the constraints. Okay, let's look at uh, one of them. We have 10 x1 plus uh, 20 x2 less than or equal to 200. For instance, let's start with the first one. Um, in order to draw these constraints in this plane, we typically solve for one of the variables. And typically we solve for the variable at the y-axis, just as we did in microeconomics. So we, we solve with respect to x2. So we isolate x2 and, and do that. And we, we really don't need to care about the inequality sign here. We might uh, treat that as a equality sign at this step. Okay. So then we produce x2 as a function of x1 and then we can plot that function in this plane. As you probably see already, that function will be a, a straight line or a linear function as we tend to call it. So if you do that, then we get 20x2 less than or equal to 200 minus 10x1, don't we? By moving that on the right side. Then we can just divide by 20 here. And we, we don't need to care about the, the inequality sign. You, you must remember, of course, that in some cases, if you do divide by a negative sign here, you will have to change the inequality sign. Okay? Keep that in mind. That's the major difference between handling inequalities and handling equalities. Keep that in mind. In this case, it doesn't matter because we divide by the positive number 20. So we end up with x2 smaller than or equal to 200 divided by 20 minus 10 divided by 20 x1. So then we have kind of achieved the target here. We get x2 as isolated. And of course, we can manipulate it a little bit more. x2 would then be smaller than or equal to 200 divided by 20 is 10, isn't it? Minus 10 divided by 20, which is a half. So this constraint can now be drawn directly in this figure by using different values of x1. Okay? If we put x1 equal to 0, we get x2 should be smaller than 10. Okay? Here is 10. So then we have uh, one point. If we would find the crossing with that one, we would put, put 10 minus a half x1 equal to 0, wouldn't we? That would produce the crossing with the first axis here. Same manner as we used in the previous course. You move half an x1 there to the right hand side, multiply by 2 to get rid of the half. So we would end up with x1 equal to 20 in this case, wouldn't we? And that could be here, for instance. Here is 20. And then we get a straight line here. This is the first constraint. And the inequality sign tells us that we, we must be below this straight line. Okay? And we already know that the x should be positive, x1 and x2 should be positive. So we are not allowed to move here or here. So this first constraint produces what we refer to as a feasible space. In this case, it is this triangle here, which we are allowed to be if this is the only constraint we have. Okay? Of course, now we can continue, draw the two other constraints, and then we will get something with some other straight lines here. We, we may cut each other, so and finally produce a final feasible space. Let's look at uh, a figure from the textbook here. Ah, now you saw my password. Did you notice it? <laughs> Please forget it. I'm not very good at changing it. 
Unfortunately, it's on tape. Maybe I should do something about that. <laughs> <laughs> I need to do a little edit there, I think. Yeah, put a kind of black. Yeah. OK, sorry about that. This user is already connected to the, OK, we don't care about that. We Is it here? Did I forget to put it up? Or did I put it here, maybe? Let's see. Here it is. So it's, uh, this figure is, is on the fronter, but it's on the under this added material folder. OK. Let us look at the first figure f first here. Blow it up a little. If you look at uh, this graph here, you can see that uh, the one we did write is here. That is this one, isn't it? Crosses in 10, crosses in 20. Here we have drawn the other two. Okay? And you see that we should always be below these ones. So you see if you look at these, the first one we did draw on the board and the one which is drawn here, you see that we must be under this one as well, meaning that we kind of get rid of this part of the feasible space. The final one goes down here, and it must be below this one as well, so all these parts are going out. So we're going to end up with a shaded area here, which is our feasible or allowed space. So we, we kind of need to search within this space to find our optimal solution. That is kind of how far we get so far. Now we need to draw the objective into this diagram. And the objective is also a straight line, so that it will be some kind of straight line here, okay? It could be here, it could be here, and if you draw it with different values, if you move downwards, it kind of gets smaller and smaller. But we want to maximize it. So we do not put it in here, do we? In that case, we can get it we can get a bigger objective if we move it upwards until we kind of hit this area here. So it should be easy to realize here that the solution we are looking for must be a solution either in these crossing points here or on these lines. And this is very important because it tells us that we don't have to search everything in here. Okay? It's enough to look at a limited set of points, basically. And if our straight line is parallel with one of those, of course, then we get, for instance, if it's parallel with this one, then we get both these points as well as the line in between. But any point here will produce the same solution. So it's really not a big point to think too hard about these very seldom cases where the objective actually is parallel with one of these lines. This boils down to that we can kind of limit our search to the crossing points here. This point, this point, this point, and this point. They have a name in this literature. They are referred to as extreme points. So they're, they're kind of candidates for our solution, and we need then just to devise some way of searching through them intelligently. And this is the so-called simplex method, which was introduced by this Dancy guy many years ago. So this algorithm, as we call it, which basically is a recipe on how to do things either on paper, but normally on a computer, is based on these principles. Okay? So you have some kind of way of finding these extreme points, how to compute them, and then to compare them. So okay, if one is better than the other, then you get rid of the first one, and then you stick to the one you have found, and then you move along in some kind of iteration to finally end up with the one which produces the optimal solution. That's basically how it works. Uh, this seems kind of simple, doesn't it? But in, in practice, it, it's, it's kind of a lot of programming needed to make an efficient simplex algorithm on a computer. Uh, luckily for us, we don't have to do that. Somebody else, else has done it many times, actually. So we can kind of rely on that and use that software instead of kind of doing this on paper. And the idea now is to introduce you to one or many possible solutions for finding solutions to linear programs. Uh, luckily, this solution also introduces or makes it possible to 
solve other types of problems. Because if all the problems that we would be interested in in this course were only of this type, then uh, we could kind of stop here. Okay? So it, it means, in a sense, that if we make changes in these models, uh, add nonlinearities, for instance, or especially if we add discrete variables, variables which are not allowed to vary continuously, then it creates problems using these algorithms. Then we have to use other algorithms. And it's even such that for certain structures of any type of problem, there could be a whole set of different algorithms. Some works good in certain situations, other works good in other situations. Then, if you are to do this in practice, of course we need to know in what situation does a given algorithm work well, as opposed to a situation where it doesn't work well. Then we have to take our situation and kind of search through literature or possible software and try to find uh, the algorithm that uh, fits best to our problem. And this is not a necessarily an easy task. And if we don't find an algorithm that solves it in reasonable time, then we may have to construct one. And a lot of lo logistics research is related to this area. How to construct algorithms to solve specific types of logistic problems with certain characteristics in such a way that the solution doesn't take weeks or months or years. Because in many of these cases, of course not in this case, but in other cases, more realistic cases, it's very easy to show that Many of the solution procedures which are available will not produce a solution in a reasonable amount of time. And of course, if you want to do this opera operationally, like in logistics, you want to solve this problem maybe every day or every week. You, you cannot start a computer it runs for two weeks if you need a solution in one week. Okay? In that case, you have to do something to construct, typically, a more efficient algorithm. And efficiency here means that the algorithm calculates the solution fast, okay? not slow as opposed to what you might, may have. Okay, so now I have briefly introduced the underlying logic behind this simplex algorithm and we need to look at some software which uh, can help us. There is a lot available. Okay? Almost any kind of mathematics package for a computer. I don't know if you know about any. There's something called uh, Maxima, for instance, something called Maple something called Mathematica. I don't know if you ever have any experience with these programs. No. Uh, these programs are kind of general mathematical tools who, for instance, do symbolic manipulation, which means that if you want to, for instance, to find the derivative of a function, you just write that function in and the computer produces the derivative for it. So it kind of contains all the rules that is needed. Okay. These packages typically has uh, special sub-packages which solves these type of problems. But there are also, should we say, specific tools, which are kind of only focused on this area. Uh, there is something which is perhaps the most well-known package called Cplex. Have you heard about it? No, perhaps not. It's a commercial program. It costs a fair amount of money. And we have licenses here on this school, which you, which you can use if you are kind of in need of doing this professionally. But there's a whole pile of these ones as well. Uh, I intend to do something called, use something called Lingo. Uh, the reason is perhaps that it's relatively easy accessible. We can kind of write the model in a fashion like this. Many of these packages has a different input system. We have to formulate the model in a, a very specific way, which uh, is not very readable and not very easy to grasp. So in order to kind of make the trans transition from from paper to computer as easy as possible, I've chosen something called Lingo here. If you want to download it, and uh, we may start looking at the web page here, okay? If you go to a web page called www.len, not gim and d, lindo.com. So there's a Lindo name on the web page and there's a Lingo name on the software. You see that they have different types of software, as you can see here. There's uh, something called Lindo, which is the main program, the kind of professional tool. And there's something called Lingo, which is kind of a, a simpler version of it, which makes it easier for students typically. And they have a student version available, which you can download freely, so you don't need to spend any money on this, okay? So if you, if you, if you click on Lingo here, 
you can see something about it. Turn until you can go to downloads here to kind of download the software, and then you see you can ch ch can choose here between various stuff, and we we go on Lingo here, and you see that uh, various versions of the program is available for download. Unfortunately, as you probably can see, it's only two types here: it's for Windows and Linux. So those of you who kind of operate on a Mac have a problem here. You do that, don't you, Maria? Yeah, I do. Are you too? Hmm? You know as well, yeah. Yeah, do you know what to do then? Of course you can run Windows programs on a Mac, can't you? Do you know how to do that? Mm. Actually, yeah, we have There's something called Wine, isn't it? W-I-N-E, I think. Let's have a look at it. Uh, if you go to Google here, where is Google? Just a short help for the Mac people, okay? Uh, wine, I think it's called. Not like drinking, but uh, wine software. Uh, let's look at that. Wine is a free and open source software application that aims to allow applications designed for Microsoft Windows to be run on Unix-like operational systems. Did you know that the Mac OS is a Unix-like operational system? You didn't know that, okay, so then it is, okay. So there is a Mac version of one, you can install it, and there is a whole lot of work to do to make it work, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, Mac OS comes with a kind of li Linux or Unix core, so you can, in principle, also use the Linux version, but I'm not sure whether it works, so I would suggest that you look into this if, if you want to. Unless you just borrow a computer here and, and use that one instead, I think that's the easiest way. But if you're uh, like a researcher and want to find out, you, you should look into this, okay? That's entirely up to you. So uh, I'm sorry about this, but uh, that's just how it works. There is not much software available for native Mac here. You can, you can of course search on Google if you write linear programming and Mac OS. If you want to use something else, that is of course possible. Program in G plus Mac. Yeah, here you see something. Uh, Lin Pro, maybe that works. I don't know. You, you can look at it yourself. Okay, I, I have a Mac myself. I may even look a little bit into it, but I, I have kind of based my teaching on this, this program. So that's how it, it's done. Okay, we were here. Let's go back a little. Let's go back to oh, if you want to do this the right way, then you should go here. Go here. Pick a version. Do you know the difference between 32 bits and 64 bit operational systems? No idea. No. You don't know what you have if you have a computer. Do you, do you, do you need to? Uh, you can check it out fairly easily, can't you? If you go in Windows 7, if you go to right click on computer and uh, use properties then you should get something out you see here system type 32 bit operation system so if you do the same on your it will tell you whether it's 32 or 64 in general you can you can run 32 bit on 64 bit so as long as you stick to 32 you, you should be fairly certain but of course if you want to do it most efficiently and you actually have a 64 bit system you should use 64 bit software because that runs faster but this is not very important in this case here. Okay, so if you stick to 32-bit, it should be okay. And as I said, unless you have uh, Linux available, then uh, you probably would like to, in to install this number 14, uh, the Windows version here, uh, this, this first one here, which is 32-bits. That's the safest one. That's the last version. But I've kind of helped you here, because the problem is that if I download this now, then I have to fill in my name, and I have to wait for an email, which gives me the download link, okay? And unfortunately, this email has a tendency to be killed by the, the spam filter. So if you have a very strong spam filter, you may lose it. So 
to make it easier for you, I kind of put this up on the front. Let's hope nobody from this uh, corporation watches this video. Well, in that case, I may run into problems. Okay. But I, I don't think. You, you see here, here is something. This program here, which is uh, happily residing on the fronter under added material, is actually what you need to download. So just click on it and save it. For instance, if you do it like this, then it probably should come up a save as here. Hopefully. Yes, do you want to open or save? I want to save it uh, as somewhere, maybe on my desktop, uh, save here, and then uh, it should come up, hopefully, in some time. Maybe it's here, I don't know. It seems to be waiting for something, is it? Maybe it takes some time. So I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not speaking this uh, Windows 7 fluently. Where can I check up my downloads? Where, where do I find it? Fine. What is downloading at the moment? There is something somewhere, isn't it? Has completed. Okay, so it's finished. Yeah, nice, nice. Okay, so now it's, uh, it's here. So I can just double click here perhaps. And then I need to extract. This is a zip file. I need to kind of do something here. How do I pack? Pack out in Norwegian means pack out. And then I do this, and then hopefully it comes. An installable, yeah, here is the installer. You double click that and then it starts installing okay, on your local computer. Of course, if you're doing this on a local computer at the university, you have to be certain that you have right access. I don't know how that works. Uh, you probably have that, I assume, as a user here. So you can actually install a program on a local computer. If you're not able to do that, you have to talk to the guys down at the basement here who kind of runs the IT center. Of course, if you have your own, it's no problem. You can do the same here on your own personal computer. Of course, not Maria, who has a Mac. Uh, it doesn't work there. But in any case, then you just hit next and it installs, OK? It co comes up. So I don't want to do this here. Cancel, yes. Because uh, I'm probably not able to do it. I don't think I have right access to this disk here. So. So let me just get rid of this now, okay? I don't need to leave that to the next lecture here, so we just get rid of it. Try again. That was not allowed. The reason is, of course, I have it here. Isn't it? Let's try again. Okay, now I was able to get rid of this. Empty. So what is this excess Excel files? It's our Excel files. Ah, we should... Uh, should we get rid of those as well? We have uh, uploaded them on the front, so they shouldn't be here. Aha! This was not correct, was it? Empty recycle bin. That is correct. Okay. So what I have done now is that I, uh, uh, hopefully I have an installation that works on this system now. Okay. So let's see if we can start the program. Then I need to go where I have put it, and I did put it on uh, a disk here. The question is whether I can find that disk. Let's see. Yeah, here are some disks. This one, I think it should be here. Now, if you see here, there's something called Lingo 12 here. So this is an old version, by the way. It's, it's not the most recent version. If you double-click here, you get into the... And here is the executable. So if I double-click that one, I get this program to start. And it starts by saying something here. Auto-update. I don't want that. I want to stick to my old version. And it, it looks like this. Okay. And the idea then is that we just write in our model straightforwardly in here. But before we do that, I think we should finish our graphical solution. Where did I put it? Here. Okay, we, we did draw all our constraints. And I said if we want to continue you know, to actually find the solution, then we also have to draw the objective. And the objective here, which is not on the board anymore, it looks like this in the straight line. And of course, as we move it down, it gets smaller. But we want to find the biggest possible one, which is inside this area. And it ends up at the crossing point there. And of course you can draw, you can kind of read out the solution here by kind of looking. Uh, and uh, you might or may not see that this point here is around x2 equals 4. This point is around x1 equals 12. So these are kind of the, the graphical information we are maybe able to get out of this, this one. The alternative, is, of course, as I said, is to move back to the the software, and then write in our model. And then we need to know how to write it in. Okay. 
Fortunately, it's, it's chronological. We write max for our objective. We put an equal sign after that code, and then we just write our model directly. Now let me see if I have it. It was 115, and then we have to use a star to denote multiplication, and then we can write x1 directly, plus the second one, 90 times x2, and then we need to end with a semicolon. We need to end all of these lines with semicolons, kind of tell the software that we have finished. You don't need to look for more information. Then we just hit return. We can uh, kind of write as many blank lines as we, we want. We don't need to care about that. And then we start writing our constraints. And we do not put in these st, we just write them directly. So it's 10 times x1 plus this is always terrifying if it works or not. Okay, 20 times x2, semicolon again. Yeah, that seems correct. And then I take the, the second constraint, 4 times x1. And if I should follow up my own way of doing this, I should perhaps do it like this then, to do it neat. Do you see? And then I can do it like this to get it kind of positioned nicely under each other. 16 times x2, another semicolon. And then the final one, which was 15 times x1 plus 10 times x2, semicolon. Now this is my whole model, isn't it? It has the objective and the three constraints. I don't have to put in these non-negativity constraints. I could, of course, write x1 larger than or equal to 0. Uh, and I hadn't, haven't done that, have I? I need to add that as well. I need to say something about... And then you use this, I seem to recall. You see these two signs? You combined smaller than sign and an equal sign. I hope this works. We will see if it doesn't, okay? And it should be 200 here. Then I have to put the semicolon behind and it should be less than or equal... Oh, oh, oh. 228, the second one, and then the final one here, less than or equal, uh, uh, uh. greater than or equal will be the opposite way, if this is the way to do it. We will see, okay, 220. Of course, no, this is a kind of file, we can save it and use it later on, uh, if you like, so that's straightforward, we can just do file here and save as, as we normally do. We decide where to save it, we, we give a name on it. This is, a, is our example LP, for instance. It has, you see, it ends with LG4, which has something to do with lingo, perhaps. I don't, I don't know why they call it 4, but okay, that's just how it is. Okay. So we save it, and if you go and look at our desktop, we see we have a file here now. If you install this correctly, this file should have an icon which resembles this one. So you can just double click the file and go directly into the system with the model. But I haven't actually installed it on this computer. I'm using it on the network now. So I have installed it on the network drive and then I, I won't get that effect. But that, that's really not a big point. So the, the next question then would be how do we, what do we do next? How do we produce the solution? And that's very easy. You just point your mouse at this, what do you call this in English? This. Uh, Something you, you shoot arrows at, what, uh, what we call it blink innovation. I don't remember the English term. Here. Maybe you, do, you know. You do you dart. What do you throw the dart arrows at? Target. Target, yeah. Wonderful, Erika. Very good. Thank you. So this target here, we just uh, click it. And if I remember correctly now, we should produce the solution. If I have some errors in my memory, it may be, we may get some errors. So let's see what's happening. Ah, it worked. If it works, it comes out, out like this. Let's see what happens if we make an error. And let's make an error. Just uh, a forced one. Let's write something like this then to see what's happening here. This, for instance, that should not be allowed. Then you see a syntax error has occurred. Okay, so there's a kind of a compiler behind here which checks whether your your file or your pro or your your program is kind of reasonably correct related to the, the rules of the system. So we have been able to force an error here. Uh, let's go back to the original correct version. 
and remove that one and hit this target again and then we get the solution out and you see here that we have the solution don't you you can see that x1 uh, it doesn't say x1 equal to but it has a, a value here which is the actual solution so this is the solution okay it's it sense here of course when you have more variables this part will be much bigger typically that you will see later on and there is some more here, there is something here called reduced cost, something here called dual price, something here called slack or surplus. Uh, this slack part here kind of tells us whether the constraint is kind of filled completely up. So slack means that you kind of do not spend all your resources. So in the middle, the second constraint here, we do not spend all our resources. There is something left we can't spend. You can see that on the figure, can't you? If we go back to it, if I'm able to produce it. Uh, let's go up here and look at the original constraints. You see here that this is the solution here, isn't it? Meaning that this one has room to move. We can kind of go further up here, if we like, but we are not allowed in the sense. So so this constraint doesn't kind of, it's not binding as we say, it has slack. That is the content of this, uh, this part under the solution here. And then we have something here which you don't need to bother about, I think. And here we have something called dual price. That is very important in the linear program because it tells you how much your objective could increase if you can increase the right hand side of the constraint a little bit. We have our constraints, we have one here. Okay. So it, this dual price tells me if I'm able to increase this resource a little bit, how much would I earn on that? And you see here that we have a fairly high dual price on this one. Okay. So if we can increase our storage of the wood type which was maple, I think, that would be most profitable because it would produce an increase in our objective of seven. If we increase this one, we get only one. Okay. This one obviously gives nothing because we don't use it fully. So this kind of thing will be always be the case. A positive value here will produce a zero there, and vice versa. So that's roughly how it works. Straightforward. You write your model, you save it, you treat it as any kind of file, like a word processing file if you like. And if you want to do a part of it, you write it down, you save it, you take it up again, you, you work on it. Okay? And if you want to solve it, you just hit this target. Straightforward. Okay, any questions? Have you tried these kind of systems before? No. Never? Okay. Then it's about time. Because uh, you're about to take a master in logistics, aren't you? So you need to know a little bit about these matters. That's uh, kind of obvious. Do anybody have any experience in program programming computers, writing computer programs? Never tried? No. You have done it a little bit, Olivia? Yeah. A little bit. What kind of programming language did you write programs in? What did you call it? Reviews. I, I'm not. Uh, there is something called uh, C, I C, Fortran. There's a whole pile of these computer programming languages. They have different uh, characteristics, they have different use. And uh, uh, in order to kind of produce this program, you have to know how to use a programming language to, to, to kind of produce a program. Uh, I've spent a fair deal of my time, many years ago, doing programming, so I know a little bit about the subject. Of course, not much about how to produce modern programs, but in the old days, we, we had to do this in order to find these solutions to these programs. We had to do it ourselves, so to speak. If you run into any, any problems acquiring this program and uh, making it work, please tell me. I'll try to help you, okay? About the Mac users, it's only you who uses the Mac here. And you know, he's not here, no. so he will have to look at the video. Okay. There is another option. Uh, 
Of course, you can install Windows on the Mac. You probably know that. Install. There's something called Boot Camp, so you can kind of have a, a, a double operation system on the Mac. You can have the Mac OS and another one, and actually as many as you like. Mm -hmm. So if you if you put down a key when you start it, it brings you a menu of possible operation systems. But you have, to have and then of course, you have to install it. In that case, you have to buy a version of Windows. But it could be easily installed. Unfortunately, these Mac computers are not kind of constructed for running Windows, so they they get a little bit warm and they don't kind of operate optimally, but I it's possible. The other alternative is to use something called vi virtualization software. Have you heard about that? Then you kind of build another computer within the computer. And that is a fresh thing, so you can install anything on it. For instance, Linux, which is free and available. And then you can install this Linux version, if you like, and then run it just the way you do here. So that is perhaps the easiest option. Uh, I need to tell you a little bit about this. Perhaps um, uh, then I have to go to Google again, I think. Virtualization software. Yeah, that, the one I like to use is called VirtualBox, actually. We might uh, say go directly for it. VirtualBox, it's in one word. Yeah, it's uh, available from uh, Oracle. It's free. And of course, it doesn't solve the problem for you. You then need an operational system to put into these kind of fresh computers. So this, the point of this VirtualBox is that the program to kind of take certain parts of your computer and freeze it for everything. So then you can install a full new or a full set of different operational systems which you can run. And as I said, Linux is free and we have this program that runs on Linux, so that's perhaps the easiest way. But again, it uh, I might help you, okay? If you, if, you, if you really want to do this, please come to me and I'll tell you how to do it and bring Jonas down in, in case he wants this as well, okay? Because this is kind of a neat program. If you want to test out different operational systems, it's a very nice way of doing it. Um, it, it works of course, not as efficient as if the program had been the only operational system, but it's not very bad. It, it, it works quite well. And of course, modern computers are kind of strong, so, so today it, it, it's really uh, an okay way to do things. There's also a, a similar type of program called VMware, I think, V-M-W-A-R-E, which kind of do the same thing. But there, there is a certain cost related to that. I think this one is completely free, so if you like, you can install it. There's a Mac version, a Windows version, any kind of versions. Okay, that kind of brings uh, the technological discussion to an end for today. I think it's about time we take a break. Okay? okay? Yeah.